as we're about to begin Hanukkah, um, what an absolutely uh, appropriate discussion to be having. And Yashik by Finkelstein for joining to uh, share with us uh, some words of Torah today uh, on the topic of Hanukkah. Yashik everybody for joining. And uh, on that note, well, I'll pass it over to Rabbi Finkelstein and uh, you can take it away. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And a big shukoyach for, for joining today. The, the topic of discussion is whether one can use electric light bulbs to fulfill the mitzvah of lighting the menorah. For specifically for Hanukkah. We will first take a look at the general literature and then towards the end, we will try, if there is a need to, differentiate between the incandescent light bulbs that have uh, were the subject of the original literature and LED light bulbs, which are mainly the, uh, the current form of, uh, of electric light bulbs. So we will explore that difference as well. Before we begin, the, just, to, just to outline the general question here of why, why there would be or why there wouldn't be an issue of using electric light bulbs, the Gemara in Shabbos and the Rishonim and the Shulchan Aruch all point out that the mitzvah minamuvchar, the best way to perform the mitzvah is with Shemen Zais, is using olive oil because the light of the olive oil is best produced when, uh, when burnt. But there are other ways to fulfill the mitzvah as well. There are other light sources that one can harness. And all of those other alternatives were a paradigm of an oil or some sort of a fuel with a wick and the flame that is attached to the wick is fed by the fuel that is drawn through the wick that feeds the flame and all of those other examples that were provided by the, the, the uh, by the poiskim, like for example wax candles, which although didn't exist or weren't used or widespread in the times of the Gomorrah, in the times of the Ramah, in the 1600s, where tallow candles or uh, candles using animal fats as fuel were a lot more widespread. Yet because we find the paradigm of the fuel, the wick, and the flame produced, that these types of alternative candles were acceptable. Whereas if we look at the electric light bulb or any other alternatives like gas, a pilot flame, or a, uh, or a kerosene, or paraffin lamps, where there is no wick that is drawing fuel to feed the flame, but it is rather a fire or a, a, a flame that draws off the fuel directly, or in the case of electricity, where an electrical, a, 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 a filament, a piece of thin metal is heated up by passing electric current through it to produce enough heat, which will eventually cause the filament to glow. This paradigm does not resemble any of the other examples that were provided by the Rishonim or by the Shulchan Aruch. And so that is where the question really begins, that were these examples of alternative candles other than olive oil, merely pragmatics because that was the other the other type of candle that was available in the times of the Rishonim and the Shulchan Aruch, or were they being specific that there has to be a source of light 
which is what the Talmud and what the poskim would term a ner, a candle, which would comprise fuel and a, a wick, which draws the fuel to feed the flame. So from the outset, it would appear that electrical light bulbs and for sure the LED light bulbs do not conform in any fashion to the mode of candles that the Gomorrah or the Rishonim offered as acceptable for Hanukkah. Not only that, but we find in the literature at the beginning of the last century, when electricity was just invented and became commercially available to households, that the poiskim of that era were of the opinion, some of them at least, that the candles that we light to commemorate the miracle of the menorah in the base of Mikdash, that our candles should in some way be reminiscent of the menorahs, the original menorahs, candles and illumination, in that in the same way as the menorah in the base of Mikdash was oil fueled with wicks that produced a single flame, that also all candles that are to be reminiscent of this miracle should also appear in the same paradigm, the same mode of having oil feeding a flame through a wick. And therefore, many of these early, uh, early opinions, I say, but these achronim of the, uh, of the late 1800s were of the opinion that any candle that did not burn in a way that reminds us of the original miracle of the menorah in the base of Mikdash is not valid for this particular mitzvah, which calls for a semblance to the original menorah. So we're going to start at this point and take a look at whether this first claim is valid. We're going to go through five points, mentioning five different issues that the Poiskim have risen over the years regarding electrical light bulbs. And the first issue that we're going to look at is this, whether the candles that we light need to resemble the menorah in the base of Mikdash with oil and wick. Now just parenthetically, before we start, um, if there are any South Africans on the group or those that are aware of uh, the, the situation in South Africa with our uh, rolling blackouts and lack of electricity, um, it may be that nowadays, if you do turn on a light bulb and the light actually comes on, that it is a miracle. So who knows? It may be probably the, the greatest zeichel and something miraculous that does resemble the original candles but for those who are, uh, are more comfortable with consistent electricity, I suppose the, the question is a lot more mundane for you. But be that as it may, the, the first one, the first POSIC to deal with the subject was the Rav of Nicholsburg, the base Yitzchak, Rav Yitzchak Schmelkes in the late 1800s and he, he was the first to deal with the subject of electricity in general, in all its different facets, in halacha. And he writes regarding the usage of electric candles, electric bulbs for the menorah as follows. He first brings his contemporaries who were of the opinion that any candle that does not resemble the original menorah is, is not valid for the mitzvah. And he argues against this. He cites several examples of what's acceptable for the mitzvah of Hanukkah, which would not have been acceptable in the base of Mikdash for the original menorah. And two examples 
which I'll outline a little bit more in a moment, are kafta ein zakukla, and the second one is the shear, the amount of oil. So the first difference that he that he points out is kafta in zakukla. We have a discussion in the Gemara in Shabbos, and is brought in Shulchan Aruch as the halacha, that if one lights one's menorah and the flame was blown out, if the flame e extinguished, that one does not have to relight the candles. If kafta, if the, the flame went out, in zakukla, there is no need to go back and relight the candle because the original lighting, the hadloka oisa mitzvah, when one originally lit the candle, one has effectively fulfilled one's mitzvah. Now, the Gomorrah in Menachas and in various other places makes it quite clear that if this sort of thing were to happen in the Beis Amikdash with the Menorah, that the Kohen would have to relight the Menorah and ensure that whatever candles went out have to be relit. In fact, so much so that the Kohen would actually have to replenish the oil and reset that entire lamp and then light it to make sure that the all the candles remain remained lit for the duration of the time that they were expected to in the Beis Amikdash. So in the same way as the menorah that we light does not have to conform to all of the principles and all of the strictures that were expected from the menorah in the Beis Amikdash, we could also argue then that the type of light which is acceptable for the mitzvah of Hanukkah need not necessarily be a candle with the setup of an oil and wicks. So that's the first point of argument that he makes. The second point that the Beis Yitzchak raises is that when it comes to the menorah that we light, the amount of fuel that is necessary is only for a certain period to last for the beginning of the evening. So one needs to have enough oil to burn from Mishatishka HaChama, from when the sun sets, Atshatichle Regal Minashuk, until the streets become deserted. And whatever that time period is in modern, in modern terms, uh, maybe we can have a discussion with, on that uh, next year. Maybe we'll set the topic a year in advance, but we should, uh, we should be able to do that indeed. But the amount of oil that's necessary for the mitzvah of Hanukkah is only really a short period for a, a certain time when the public are available. Whereas the amount of oil that's necessary for the menorah in the Beis Amikdash is Me'erev at Boiker, the oil has to last the entire night. And the menorah in the temp in the Beis Amikdash should be remain alight for the entire, the entire night. So there as well, we see that the expectations for the type of candles for lighting the menorah for Hanukkah is not the same as what was in the Beis Amikdash. And therefore, the Beis Yitzchak argues that Although we light candles to remind us of the miracle, and we do light candles because they do resemble the menorah that was in the base of Mikdash and where the miracle occurred, nonetheless, the purpose of these candles is not to be a substitute for the, the candles of the menorah in the base of Mikdash, but rather reminiscent which means that we need to produce light, not necessarily produce the same apparatus that was used in the Beis Amikdash in the original menorah. And therefore, the Beis Yitzchak was quite comfortable hold, to hold that one can use electric light bulbs to light the menorah for Hanukkah. And he also held that uh, spirit lamps or kerosene lamps where there was no wick, but rather a, a way to channel 
the, the chemicals to produce a light, to produce a flame without the wick was also sufficient. And it could also, those types of lights could also be used to fulfill the mitzvah of Neiris Hanukkah. So that was the first opinion, the Beis Yitzchak. And he argues to the side of leniency that one should indeed be able to use electric light bulbs for Neiris Hanukkah. We now move on to the second point. Before we go through the next few opinions, at the time that this question was posed to the Achronim, it seemed that the question was something similar to a situation where you know something's wrong, but you just can't quite put your finger on it. And therefore, we do find amongst the literature that there were other side reasons that the Poiskim brought to show how electricity is not not uh, is, is disqualified from Neiris Hanukkah. And because maybe the, 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 uh, the knowledge, the technical knowledge of how electricity produces light was, uh, was not known to many, they looked for other ways to either discredit or uh, try and vindicate the usage of electric light bulbs. And that is where we're going with the next few items that the opinions were looking at areas far out, uh, really beyond the realm of Neiris Hanukkah and generally in the realm of mitzvahs. So we now move to the second opinion which was Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank. He was the Rov of Yerushalayim in the 1940s and the 1950s. And in his work, Har Tzvi, he presents the following uh, reason why electricity cannot be used to fulfill the mitzvah of Hanukkah. He maintains that when doing a mitzvah, one has to be active in the initiation of the mitzvah, especially when it comes to lighting candles, whether it's Shabbos candles or whether it's the menorah. And he brings a proof from, or the source from uh, various poiskim in Shulchan Aruch, the Magen of Rom being one of them. And Rav Frank therefore holds that it would not be possible to fulfill the mitzvah by merely flicking a switch and allowing the apparatus itself to set up the mitzvah, what he calls a gromer, a method where the mitzvah is brought about indirectly, but not through the direct action of the one who is to fulfill the mitzvah. Now, in a way, we can understand this because the midst of the, the brocha that we make over the lighting of the menorah is lahadlik ner Hanukkah or lahadlik ner shel Hanukkah, that the mitzvah is to light the menorah, to kindle the lights of Hanukkah. And we have a run in Psochim. The run in Psochim differentiates or goes through a whole list of various mitzvahs that one can do via an agent or mitzvahs that one has to do personally. And based on this, the run explains the different formulas of brochas that we make over mitzvahs. Over some mitzvahs, the brocha is made with the, uh, with the infinitive lahadlik, lahaniach, to light, to put on tefillin. And some mitzvahs are made over the, the, uh, the mere result of what's going to happen. Like the mitzvah to check for chometz, the brocha is al biur chometz, the mitzvah we, the, 
the bracha is made over the eradication of chometz, not to eradicate, but over the eradication. And therefore the run points out that wherever the bracha of the infinitive is used, lahadlik, to light, lahaniach, to put on tefillin, that it is incumbent upon the one who is doing the mitzvah to do it personally and be active in the process. And therefore, it would follow that since the brocha we're making over the menorah is lahadlik ner Hanukkah, to kindle the lights of the menorah, it would imply that one needs to be actively involved in initiating the flame, in getting the, the process going, and then withdrawing and allowing the flame to continue burning on its own, which means that the human element is of, uh, of uh, is, is a sine qua non, that it is imperative for the person to be doing the mitzvah himself. And therefore, this would support the assertion of Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank that to light a menorah, which requires lahadlik, which requires the personal involvement, by merely flicking a switch and allowing the apparatus to do the work automatically, that such a menorah lighting would be insufficient. And so that is the second point as to why electric light bulbs would not suffice for lighting Hanukkah licht. Now, at the same time, we do find a chronium like Rabbi Cheska Landau, the Tzlach, the Noida Behuda, who was the Rov of Prague in the, the 1700s, early 1700s. that he maintains when doing a mitzvah, it's not incumbent upon the person to do the mitzvah himself, but rather one can set up certain apparatus and sometimes one can even get another to do the mitzvah on one's behalf. So it is not an ironclad argument here that one needs to do the mitzvah personally and that one needs to light the candles personally and start the process oneself and there are other Rishonim who dispute the run in Psochim when it comes to why some brochas get the formula of lahadlik or lahaniach, and why some other mitzvahs get the brocha of al biur too over the doing of the mitzvah. So it's not a clear cut uh, uh, principle here, and it's not a guarantee that there is in fact this obligation for the person to light the menorah himself. And so one could argue that flicking a switch and allowing electric current into the system to bring the light into the, uh, into the light bulb is good enough to fulfill the mitzvah. It's not a, uh, a hard and fast rule here that mitzvahs have to be done personally uh, using one's own one's own hands. Okay. So with that in mind. The second point that Rotsvi Pesach Frank made was that a mitzvah has to be done actively. And there as well, it's not a clear cut rule. And it could be that electric, uh, electric light bulbs would in fact uh, have the necessary criteria for the mitzvah. So that was the second point. The third point is something that was raised by Rosh Hashanah Zalman Arbach. We have a, a principle which we do find in the, the Poiskim, especially in the, in the Achroinim, that when one lights one's Hanukkah licht, one should have enough fuel 
to last, as I mentioned earlier, a certain time into the night. And one has to guarantee from the start that that fuel is, is, is in fact going to last that, uh, that amount of time. Now, Rav Shlomo Zalman, in a very, in a, a move of uh, really a, a stroke of genius, points out that when it comes to electric light bulbs, at the time that one switches the bulb on, it's not, a, uh, it's not that one is taking the, pre the, the prerequisite amount of fuel and allowing the light bulb to continue kindling from that fuel because there is no fuel when it comes to electricity. It is current that is produced by a generator and that generator produces current all the time and it is new current that is fed into the system. And so when one is about to fulfill the mitzvah of lighting the menorah, one does not have fuel at one's disposal. It's one's disposal, in fact, one has no fuel, which is the halachic requirement before lighting the menorah. Instead, one is relying on new current to be created over and over again in order to feed the system and eventually feed the light. So since there is no tangible amount of fuel that one has prepared beforehand, electric light bulbs would then be disqualified. So that was the third point where Rosh Hashanah Zalman Aubach held that electric, uh, electric light bulbs cannot be used for, to fulfill the mitzvah of Neiros Hanukkah. Maybe based on this logic then, if one was using a battery operated system where the battery itself is set up to provide a certain amount of hours of light and of, uh, of current available, then perhaps based on this reason, then a battery or a, a, a collection of cells that produce electricity should be sufficient because that would be the intangible equivalent of having the required amount of fuel from the outset. So that is an argument that could be made either in support or against. Be that as it may, that is the third reason why the, the Poiskim did not want to allow for electric, uh, electric light bulbs for Hanukkah Licht. The fourth item can be found in the chuvas of the Levushe Mordechai, Rav Mordechai Winkler, who was a rov in Europe. He passed away just before the uh, 1930s. And he was also presented with this question of electric light bulbs. And he was of the opinion also, like I mentioned earlier, that the candles that we use to commemorate the miracle should be similar to the ones that were in the Beis Amikdash. And therefore, electric light bulbs would not qualify. And in addition to that, the Levusha Mordechai puts forward that it, it's, it's, it's obvious to him that if one were to use a single match or a single wood chip that was left burning, that that would also not suffice because although the wood chip is able to keep a, a flame attached to it, the wood chip is not drawing from any oil or from any fuel and in such does not resemble the menorah or any of the other candles that the, that the Poiskim allowed for. So now in addition to the Beis Yitzchak's argument against this line of logic that the candles do not need to resemble that which was in the Beis Amikdash, there is also another, another point here that a wood chip is probably not going to last very long and it's probably not going to produce a flame. If anything, the wood chip will either burn out or it will, uh, 
It will turn glowing red before it burns out. And that's probably why using a wood chip was never offered by the Gomorrah or any of the Rishonim as a, a, a type of candle which is effective, uh, not because you need to have a wick and you need to have fuel to feed that wick, but rather it is just so impractical. And the probability of getting a wood chip to burn and produce a flame for a certain amount of time is uh, most uh, highly, highly unlikely. But it's not to say that because a wood chip was never offered as a method to, to substitute the menorah, that that would automatically disqualify anything that is not a candle per se. So up to now, we've mentioned four points of argument against, or, and in one case for, the usage of electric light bulbs for Hanukkah licht. I'll just run through them one more, one more time before we move on to the last and uh, probably most important part of this discussion. The first point was whether the candles that we use for menorah need to resemble the original candles in the Beis Amikdash. And the Beis Yitzchak proved that this is not the case. The candles that we use for menorah, although they're used to uh, remind us of the miracle, the miraculous uh, events around the menorah in the Beis Amikdash, the candles that we use have very different criteria and very different expectations. The second point was groma. Can one do a mitzvah through setting up the apparatus to continue doing the mitzvah itself? So there was argument for and against. The third point was electricity not having the shear, not having the amount at the, out, on, uh, at the outset available since electricity is generated and produced. And there as well, one could argue that perhaps batteries that can provide electricity on demand would be something similar to fuel. And then the fourth was whether a wood chip would suffice and why the Poiskim never mentioned the usage of a single piece of wood that burns. And that can be argued either it's because a wood chip is not reminiscent of the miracle or a wood chip is just impractical and highly unlikely to be usable. Okay. So at this point, one can make arguments for and against using electricity. There is no compelling evidence from the Gomorrah or from the Rishonim to say either way that electricity and electric light bulbs would be disqualified as a means of lighting the menorah. And now we move on to the fifth and final point, which is the issue of a Madura. We begin with a Gomorrah in Shabbos that allows for multiple wicks to be placed into a single vessel of oil and for multiple users to fulfill their mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah licht with their different wicks that are all sharing the same bowl of oil. However, the Gomorrah makes it clear that this could only be when a lid, a cover of some sort, was placed over the wicks, allowing each wick to come through the cover at a different, uh, a different hole, which would separate one wick from another, and then multiple users would be allowed to light their menorah each with one wick from this collective bowl. However, if there were no such contraption, allowing the wicks to be separated from one another, then the Gomorrah holds that such a a collective, such a collection of wicks would be disqualified because then the wicks are no longer candles, but 
what the Gomorrah calls a madura or a bonfire or what we would call a torch or a collection of lights. Rashi there on the Gomorrah explains that if the wicks are left, invariably the flames that they produce will fuse if they're close enough together. And that fusion of the different flames would result in one giant flame, which resembles more of a, a fire in the bowl. And once those flames unite to, to form a giant, uh, a giant fire-like ball, then says Rashi, this type of fire is no longer considered a nair, it's not a candle, but rather a madura, a, a fire. This Gomorrah is brought in the poskim and it's brought down as the halacha in Shulchan Aruch, that if one wants to use multiple wicks, one has to ensure that each wick remains distinct from the other and that the flames are prevented from uniting in any way, because once the flames unite, then the wicks cease to become candles, a nair, and instead become one giant ball of light, which is a madura. Now it is based on this that several of the, the poskim disqualify an electric light bulb because the amount of light that is emitted from the light bulb does not appear to be a single flame like that of a candle, but rather a mass of light which is emitted, which is more like a madura more like a bonfire or more like a, a, a torch and is not classically considered a nair, a candle per se. The first one to make this argument was the Kafa Chaim. Rabbi Chaim Soifer, he was a rov in Yerushalayim in the early 1900s and he authored a work, the Kafa Chaim, on Orachayim and on Yoridea, with many a collection of many different commentaries, especially from uh, Swardi chuvas and Swardi manuscripts that weren't easily available to the public. And he makes this argument that electric light bulbs are more like a madura, more like a fire, than a flame of a candle. Another contemporary who seconded this approach was the Tzitzeliezer. Rabbi Yudelezer Waldenberg, who was a rov in Yerushalayim, he passed away some 15 years ago, also makes this argument that an electric light bulb is more like a madura, more like a bonfire, than it is a flame, a single flame. Towards the end of the tshuva, however, the Tzitzeliezer is not quite sure whether a madura, a uh, fire of this nature, would only be disqualified if it were a candle that wasn't an oil candle because he found various other textual variances of the Gomorrah that we have in front of us. And therefore, the tzitzilias doesn't really commit. He leaves it as a, a tzorich ion. But the point of the matter is that because an electric light bulb produces copious amounts of light, not like that of a candle which produces a single flame. And one can see the result that if one were to light up a candle in a dark room, at most, that candle would be able to focus on one area in the room or one very, very small and restricted space in that room. And it would illuminate in a clear way only really part of, of a room, whereas an electric light bulb can light up the entire room very clearly and of course, the stronger the wattage, the brighter the light. So an electric light bulb would tend more to the side of a Madura. It would resemble more of a collection of different lights with different strengths than it would a candle, which has one strength and one uh, a, a single, single flame and is very limited in the scope of how much it can illuminate.
with this in mind, before we come to any, any sort of conclusion, let's digress slightly and learn a, a little bit, learn the sugya of the Madura, understand what makes a Madura, a collection of flames and a bright flame, uh, a, a type of light which is now disqualified to recall the miracle of Hanukkah. When we learn through this Gomorrah and through the Poiskim, we're struck with several questions. Firstly, where do we draw the line between a candle, a nair, and a madura, a fire? If we think about it, a candle which has a wick can be made of several strands. No wick is really made of one piece of material that's, that's been twisted. Sometimes you would get a thick wick which has been made of uh, several strands and produces uh, maybe a, a, a flame, a single flame with a, a broader base at the bottom. But at the end of the day, where do we draw the line between what's considered a single flame and a candle, a nair, and multiple flames or a large flame, a madura? There seems to be a subjective amount. Secondly, does this mean that if one has a giant menorah where the, each candle has to be made of thick wicks, which would produce a larger flame than would be if it were a tiny candle in one's own personal menorah at home, does this mean to say then that giant menorahs and the flames that they produce are not considered candles and are not zeichel and neis, and one would not be allowed to make a brocha and one would not be allowed to, to, to light such candles? Would that then now cast aspersions on the whole exercise of public menorahs? Or would one have to invest in a menorah where there are maybe large bowls of oil, but tiny, tiny uh, wicks in each candle uh, that would probably go unnoticed. And another thing, what is in fact the problem with the Madura? Why is a large flame as opposed to a, a smaller single flame problematic that the Gomorrah would take it for granted that a Madura, something with greater light intensity, is no longer fit for the Menorah to be used for Neiris Hanukkah. So to answer these questions, if we take a look at some of the Rishonim, we have the Ravio for one, and we take a look at some of the Achronim, we have the Chuvas of the Shev Yaakov. We find that there are two aspects to the mitzvah, which it actually seems there are two aspects. However, they are one and the same. And that is that the menorahs that we light are not only to commemorate the miracle of the lighting of the menorah in the base of Mikdash, but also to publicize that miracle. We find the aspect of Pirsum and Nissa, which is quite prevalent, that there is an aspect of this mitzvah, which is to publicize the miracle, not only to others, but to oneself, and to make one aware of this supernatural event that occurred with the menorah in the Beis Amikdash, where the principles of physics and of combustion were suspended in the face of a miraculous event, and that the menorah that we light in our homes 
not only should be reminiscent, but should be uniquely uh, configured in such a way that by looking at the lights of the menorah, one cannot confuse them for any other lights in the home. They are unique and their symbolism and their presence can only be interpreted by the onlooker as reminiscent of what was in the Beis Amikdash. And therefore, the Gomorrah puts forward that any lights that resemble the mundane and ordinary household lights, household methods of lighting, would not perform Pirsuma Nisa. It would not give us the impression that we were looking at something unique which was lit solely and expressly to remind us of the miracle. But rather, we would get the impression that it's like every other light or every other source of heat in the home, which would defeat the purpose of Nehru's Hanukkah altogether. And so to answer the question, where do we draw the line between a Madura, something which is more uh, resembling more of a bonfire and a nair, a candle, would not be in the size of the fire or the intensity of the fire or the amount of light that the fire produces, but rather it would be in the shape and the form and the significance of the fire that was lit. That if a candle was lit, to commemorate the miracle of Hanukkah, and that's all that one can see in the candle, then that is called a ner for our purposes. But once one has multiple lights which resemble a common household fire, then the imagery of the Hanukkah lift is lost, and the semblance of the miracle and the reminder of the miracle, the Pursuma Nisa, is no longer possible because our perception of the fire in front of us is now one of an ordinary household fire, not a unique and special tribute to the miracle that was. And so the difference between a Nair and a Madura is that a Nair reminds us of the miracle and a Madura doesn't give us that, uh, that message at all. And that would also answer the second question that having giant menorahs with flames that are bigger, a lot more intense than the flames that would be produced by a single candle in our homes is still reminiscent of the miracle since the entire structure of the menorah, the giant menorah, and the flames that it produces are there solely as a tribute to the miracle of Hanukkah. And that is the message that one gets when one sees these giant menorahs. There can be no mistake that one is watching a giant menorah lighting and nothing else. And therefore, one can understand that an electric light bulb, which appears to be a source of regular light in the home, because that is the way that we illuminate our homes nowadays. This it may be except for South Africa, but everywhere else in the world, that's, that's usually what's used to illuminate one's homes. So there is nothing unique that stands out in an electric light bulb as being a tribute to the miracle of Hanukkah. And therefore, in the same way as a Madura would not serve the purposes of Pirsuma Nissa of providing the amount of attention necessary to the mitzvah, so to an electric light bulb. And the same would apply all the more so then to LED light bulbs, which emit light, but not using combustion or in, uh, similar to the, electric, the, uh, the, uh, the tungsten filament, but rather by passing electrical current through various semiconductors, semi -mat uh, certain materials that they release photons, they produce light without any semblance to combustion, all the more so LED light bulbs would be disqualified since they are part of the uh, mainstream of what uh, what we consume in our in our homes for our general uh, electrical needs. 
This would also answer several other questions regarding Neiris Hanukkah, things that were raised by the various achronim. But because we are uh, we're nearing the end of our session, I think it would be better to just rather wrap it up at this point and in summation, conclude with the following. That in an instance where one doesn't have a menorah available and one wants to use an electric light bulb instead, then if it is an ordinary household light bulb from a, a light, a chandelier, a lamp, a torch, a, uh, an electric flashlight, then this type of light doesn't present any pirsuma nissa. There's nothing unique about the light in, uh, in one's home that stands out as a tribute to the miracle of Hanukkah and therefore would be like a Madura that would not be acceptable in any sense as Neiris Hanukkah. However, if one doesn't have a menorah, but one does have some sort of uh, electric substitute for candles, so if one has a menorah with various light bulbs in it that's built to look like a menorah and that at least has some symbolic uh, uh, semblance to a menorah and that symbolic semblance gives us the impression that we're looking at something zeichel and nice. there is an element of Pirsuma Nissa and one does get the impression that one is looking at a menorah, then we have a discussion amongst the various poiskim that we uh, that we brought today, that there is the base Yitzchak who held that the candles that we light do not need to really resemble that which was in the base Amikdash. And with an electric light bulb of such a nature, one can use it if need, if need be to fulfill one's mitzvah of uh, Hadlokas Neiris and Pirsuma Nissa, publicizing the miracle. Of course, we have a plethora of Poiskim who holds that one should not use electric light. However, in cases of necessity, if that's all that's available, then one would be able to, or there is room to rely on the base Yitzchak if one is really desperate, provided that there is this element pardon the pun, this element of your Nissa, and that one should not make a brocha because of the, of the dictum of Suffolk brochas lahakil, that when in doubt whether one is genuinely performing the mitzvah, one should rather take the steps of the mitzvah, but one should not perform, one should not make a brocha, lest the brocha that one is making is in vain. So this seems to be a, a consensus amongst the, uh, the contemporary post game of our age. So hopefully that uh, was able to, here's another pun, shed a bit of light on the subject. And Mir Sashem, we should be able to merit to be in the Beis Amikdash and to see the menorah as it was in its full glory once more in the same way as it was dedicated by the Chashmonoim and Rabbi Yochanan Kohen Godel in the times of the Yavonim, so too may we merit to see the Kohanim lighting the menorah together with all the other beautiful avoiders in the Beis Amikdash to come. And may we rejoice in the light, the light of the menorahs in our own homes and the light of Mashiach in the future. Amen.